I'm Martin Nietzsche and I'm your host tonight and I will give you one or two minutes until the last participants who are just registering at the moment are coming online and it would be great if you show me that you can find the chat and just put in the chat where are you, where are you at the moment that would be interesting to me. I am in Pinneberg which is near Hamburg so I put in here Germany and there is Abby, and she is from Bern in Switzerland. Well, we know that, Abby. <laughs> but there might be some others. Ah, we have Barbados again. Always Barbados. Barbados is always one of the first ones. And I'm looking out of my window. It's cold. We have snow in Hamburg at the moment, which is rare. And uh, I would like to be in Barbados. Then we have South Africa. We have Tbilisi, which is great. I was in Georgia in July and it was a fantastic holiday. So that's interesting. Then we have South Africa. We have Austria. Montreal in Canada. Hey, it's early there. What is the time in Montreal? It must be something like 10 o'clock in the morning or something like that. Or even earlier. 10 a.m. Yeah, that was right. Then we have El Salvador, we have Hong Kong, we have Palestina. Well, oh, great. So again, Russia, snowy Canada. Yes, I, I, I assume that's snowy as well. So let, let's dis discuss in the future, we are all traveling to, to Barbados and we will make the next <laughs> meeting in Barbados and we will do it <laughs> offline. We will talk about online and offline in the next minutes, but uh, the next meeting should be online well, offline on Barbados, I think that would be my preference. And the five okay. days meeting. Five days meeting, yes, minimum. And on the beach. Japan, it must be late in Japan already. What is it now in Japan? Is it like 10 p.m. or even yeah, later, I think? Thailand as well. It's very late there. So it's great to have you all online. And as we are already more than 50 participants, I think let's start... Uh, we will have a great innovation talk. I'm really interested in that topic. But before I really start to moderate, I will give over to Olivier Boussard from the UPU. And uh, he wants to say probably hello to you as well. So, Olivier, up to you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And, and again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. It's fantastic to see all those participants from everywhere in the world. Uh, thank you very much for, for connecting and being with us uh, uh, today. It's really a, a great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, innovation talk. It's actually the number eight of uh, this series of webinars that uh, we are organizing under the umbrella of the Direct Marketing Advisory Board of the uh, Universal Postal Union. Uh, as you all probably know, the, the Direct Marketing uh, Advisory Board is a group of uh, postal operator, but also private sector uh, organization that that works to promote direct marketing as a postal product and and also discuss the the challenges and, and opportunities for the development of direct marketing and uh, during our innovation talks the eight the seven innovation talks that we had uh, this year we have indeed addressed many uh, of the drivers and, and trends that are influencing direct marketing today and uh, that will influence direct marketing tomorrow more more importantly um, the last session that we have today will address the core of the dilemma that is facing the direct marketing business. I'm talking here about the, the, the digital versus physical uh, nexus. Um, some are considering that digital media are, are a threat to physical communication, when others are seeing the combination of both offline and online channels as the best way to achieve customer acquisition. And uh, this discussion is today absolutely critical for many postal operators in the world in building their direct marketing strategies. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm therefore extremely happy and very excited uh, that we are today benefiting from the views and, uh, and, and uh, the analysis of our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Ralph Kreitzer. Welcome, uh, Ralph, to this innovation talk. Uh, Ralph is a professor of marketing at Berlin School of Economics and Law. And I'm sure that we will uh, learn a lot uh, from him, from his experience, uh, both uh, from his uh, impressive academic background, of course, but also from his business experience. So I really wish you all a very, very fruitful and successful uh, webinar and fruitful session. 
and uh, back to you, Martin, and uh, see you all in, a, in an hour. <laughs> Thank you. I, I hope it's a little bit less than an hour because yeah. I'm quite sure that you will have some questions, as I know. Probably. Uh, thanks, Olivier. <laughs> thanks, Abby, for giving us a good start. And uh, I would like to introduce, actually, our guest today, which is Ralf Kreutzer. Uh, it's a very German name. I'm, I'm sorry for that. And even his, uh, his first name is written not with a PH, as normally all Ralfs in the world are, but with an F, which is the German version of Ralf. So, um, but I think that the pronunciation is nearly the same. So you can, can just say Ralf, and you will know whom we mean, whom we are talking about. So Ralf is... Um, somebody I know for, for probably at least 15 years now. And he is one of the persons who, from my personal opinion, is not only the academic guy, but has a good combination of practical knowledge. He was working in the industry for lots of years. Uh, he was even working for a subsidiary of German Post in some time in the past. And um, so uh, he has a good practical know-how. And at the same time, he is somebody who really wows his students. So he's a great professor. And I, I can tell you that because I, I know some of his students and they are all talking very good about him. So I'm quite sure that he can do both. Um, and he is somebody who is, well, actually directly at this line between online and offline. So uh, we were on several in the dialogue tours together in innovation topics in, in Japan, in, in in, in southern Korea and especially in, in China and uh, we saw a lot of interesting companies over there together but on the other side Ralph wrote over 50 books and all of them are published on paper and as you see in the background this is not a not a zoom background with some virtual books it's real physical books behind him and so he has, has some very interesting background in both of these worlds, offline and online. And I think this is something that really makes him the best speaker we could get today for that topic. So because, before I talk any longer, which is already too long, Ralph, I would like to give over to you. The floor is yours, and we are very, very interested in your presentation. And like always, we are interested in dialogue as well. So we will have now about half an hour presentation and then we all can ask our questions. If you have questions, please put them in the chat or directly when you have the question or later on. And we are looking forward to the dialogue with you. Ralph, did you get your computer working so that we can start with the presentation? Yes, first of all, I would like to thank you for the very nice introduction. I thank you for the attentiveness of the <clears throat> speakers we have today and I'm going to share my screen with you so Martin are we able are you able to see my screen not yet not yet then we already did it successfully So all the, the audience, you see that we are live. Okay. Ah, now now <clears throat> I can see your screen. Yes, and ready to go. Perfect. So have a lot Here of fun are. with us. Okay, thank you. So the big challenge, the very exciting question, online or offline, or the combination of the best of both. And I would like to cover with you some key questions. First of all, online marketing has taken off. We should understand why to have a convincing answer to this situation. What could help co convince our customers to invest again, or at least also in offline media? KPIs could show the way, and I will end with a little conclusion from my point of view. If you first focus on the question why online market advertising has taken off, we have to take a look at this development, digital advertising spending worldwide. We just see one direction, significant growth rates year by year. And we need to understand what are the main reasons 
that advertising in the online world is so important. We should understand why our customers switch to the online world in many cases. First of all, we can see that there are very short setup times for online marketing campaigns. And we can always compare it with our offers as uh, postal operators, how short are our setup times. It's very easy to track, often in real time, in the online world. And we can also very easily optimize our campaigns, again, based on retail, advertise, uh, retail data when we are in the online area. We often see an ease of use. We can order something, we can book something by online platforms. We have really a large number of different communication channels with almost infinite, uh, infinite varieties of advertising. The online competitors offer our online availability 24 seven, a wide range of customization options. And it's really a question I will cover a little bit later, whether these are these opportunities, these online opportunities are really covered or connected with lower costs. What we need to do as a postal operator is to conduct a digital gap analysis. What's meant by it? We have to look at the development over time that there is a huge potential for change. There are a lot of competitors offering new solutions. Technologies offer us very interesting solution as well. And we need to find out how strong is the willingness for change in our own organizations. Do we have, I hope, smart managers like you, the audience today, to use the potential for change? Or do we wait for breaking points where we are forced more or less to change something? But you can see here is still a gap between what is possible and what we as organizations use. And this gap <clears throat> is nothing but the potential flight path for competitors. So by doing nothing, or by doing not enough, we invite competitors to attack us, to attack our markets, to uh, acquire our customers. And all these things are supported by what we call the disruptive technologies. So it would be very nice for all of you to find out which alternatives, which alternative solutions, which competitors use the potential more successfully than ourselves. And how much of this potential do we really use in our own organizations? Because if we don't use it, somebody else will. Therefore, especially as post operators, we have to answer several questions. When we focus the short setup times, we need to ask ourselves, can we compete with the set, uh, sub, uh, set up times of online channels? Is there a need for improvement, a potential to become better? When we focus the ease of use, is booking our services as easy as with online media and available 24 seven? And if not, what can we do to improve it? A quick advertising check is indispensable. Can we offer these kind of tracking solutions similar to those of our online competitors? When we focus on the individualization of communication, this is a mega trend in marketing. Do our price concepts promote or prevent the individualization of communication? And I remember when I worked for the German Post, we have lists, wonderful price lists, and when customers want to do a little bit more of individualization in the text, in the mailings, it's say, okay, this is not a mass communication any longer, so we have higher prices for it. So do we punish our customers 
when they want to follow this mega trend in marketing. And that this trend of individualization is really important. I would like to share with you some leading benefits from individualization based on a study in the United States, where we can see what we can achieve by a higher level of individualization, improved customer experience, increased conversion rates, increased engagement, increased lead generation, and so on. So individualization really has a very strong impact on the success of our customers. And the question is, do we support our customers by having a lot of individualization possibilities, or do we punish them by higher prices? There are some additional questions to answer. Optimization of ongoing processes is often a standard in the online sector. Do we offer similar possibilities as well to improve an ongoing campaign? Convenience is a key driver of success. How easy it is for our customers to book our solutions online. And very nice question, is it fun? Do our customers really love our the experience we offer to them? Or is it as nice as going to the dentist? Marketers love variety and innovation. Do we block or support this creativity with our solutions? And finally, many online plot platforms offer comprehensive data pools to optimize the booking process. What do we offer here? And you can go through the list on your own to find out where there might be some room for improvement to make it uh, less easy for our competitors to attack us and to acquire our customers. And these are really questions all postal operators should answer. I already mentioned that I will take a look, uh, a closer look at the low cost criterion, which is often offer, mentioned in the online world. And we can see that a lot of companies focus on performance marketing, short term conversation, co co conversion do whatever converts now, priorities on immediate wins. And a lot of companies, of small and uh, bigger companies, found out that they have focused too much on performance marketing and they missed to invest a bit more in brand marketing, where we generate long-term brand equity, where patience is required, and we should focus the point that short-term conversation is easier to achieve than brand building. But, and this is an argument, this is a reason which you can use in your sales processes as well, that online often reaps what was sown offline. So online is harvested what was created in the offline world beforehand. And this is something we need to take into consideration because some of the companies already said we focus too much on performance marketing and performance marketing in many areas is online marketing. So we need the balance. We have to create real value here as well because you can only harvest here in the online world which you have sown in the offline world beforehand. And it's once again about the combination. And a key question is in this context, how could we help convince our customers to invest in the offline media? And here I would like to share with you some interesting results based on the Stavanger Declaration. And this declaration really addresses the future of reading. So how will we read or how should we read in the future? About 200 scholars and scientists of reading, publishing, literacy from across Europe researched the impact of digitalization on reading practices. And the target of the research was to find out 
the best ways to utilize the advantages of both paper and digital technologies, and this across age group and purposes. And there are very interesting findings which you can use in your acquisition process as well. When we focus on digital text, they offer excellent opportunities to tailor text presentations. So, individualization is key in this area, and digital, the digital tools, the digital technology makes it very easy to tailor presentations. Benefits for comprehension and motivation have been demonstrated when the digital reading environment was carefully designed for the reader in mind. So, if I really tailor my content, it could have a very positive impact on the comprehension of my content and on motivation. Nevertheless, there's a big but as well. And this is very important and you should take this into consideration for your sales process as well. Online readers, very interesting finding, are more likely to be overconfident about their comprehension abilities. In, when they read in the digital world in comparison to reading print. And we know that many of us as well are more skimming and we are often less concentrating on the content we have online in front of us. And this is something we should take into consideration when we try to motivate uh, our customers to use more the offline concepts as well. And they conducted an additional study with about more than 170,000 participants. And they found out that the comprehension of long informal, long form informational text is stronger when we read it on paper. So we can really say when people write uh, read on paper, they will have a better understanding of the content and this is something we can use in our sales process as well. What do you we want to achieve? It's only performance. Do you, want, do you only want to get a high conversion rate right now? Or, you, or do you want to share some of the insights which should last longer in the brains and maybe in the hearts as well of our customers? It was very interesting as well. That the so called digital natives, people growing up in the digital world, they also show inferior or the screen inferior effects were even stronger than with the digital immigrants. So, when we see, when we say the digital natives are better in using digital media, it's just one thing, it's wrong. And I unfortunately uh, experienced this in my classes as well. We have to find out again and again that basic information is no longer available in the brains of my wonderful students. They don't, they don't read offline. They only scan online content and they don't have a convincing picture even on the master level of my students in their brain. And when I want to talk to them about ongoing discussions, very often as to say there is no knowledge. They even don't know what the term fracking means in our world. Not so convincing. And there is one additional thing which is quite interesting and we call it embodied cognition. That means when we use our hands as well, when we read something, we have a pencil, we mark something and so on, it has an impact on our own body. So when we do something with our hands when reading, and I wonder how often you write on your screen. Maybe we have a special stick, yes, but in general, we just scan it. So the embodied cognition is something educators, readers, and also we as marketers should take into consideration that we try to motivate people to use, uh, to do something with their hand as well, because it ha will have an impact on our brain and whether we have a better understanding and uh, that the information lasts longer in our wonderful brains. How, could we how can we use the findings? 
of the Stavanger Declaration, we have to ask our customers the following questions. What do you want to achieve? Just short-term reactions. Then very often, unfortunately, we have to say then online versions are very effective and very efficient as well. Or are you also interested in the long-term development of brand reputation, for example, and the deep anchoring of our service in the customer's consciousness? If this is our target, we at least should recommend our customers that they should think in addition to online uh, channels of offline channels and wonderful mailings, for example, as well. Besides these interesting findings, there are some additional advantages which we can use in the sales process. We need to figure out whether our customers are aware of the following facts. And these are results from a worldwide basis. Around globally, more than 40% of the internet users use ad blockers each month. So they try to get rid of this, uh, I, ca I call it advert uh, adver uh, advertising attack online. The click-through rate for paid search ads is around 1.7% of social media ads, even lower, because here I'm in the search mode. Here I'm in social media, it's 1.1. And the click-through rate for display ads is around 0.03 on a worldwide basis on average for all the formats. And the average reading time for an email is just 10 seconds. And in addition, from my point of view, a very interesting information as well is that the online environment is really a red ocean. A lot of competition, only click away. And in the on offline world, is it's very often less red and a bit more of a blue ocean because uh, less competitors use the traditional offline uh, channel now. And so when I take a look in my letterbox, I don't have so many mailings any longer, even so I'm quite active customer, um, but I have a lot of traffic in the online world. So more red ocean in the online world and a bit of a blue ocean in the offline world. And from my point of view, one additional good reason for offline advertising. When we take a look at the, off uh, at the offline world, we have physical materially tangible elements. And in the online world, we just have digital elements. So if we can reach in the on offline world, our customers via, via five senses. And we only have two senses to use when we are online. And this is also something we should clarify what is really needed by a certain campaign, are five senses enough? Or do we need more senses to really convince the customers? And when we once again ask the customers how happy they are with the uh, online world, then I would like to share with you some insights from the United States, UK and Germany. Where they say, for example, I'm often annoyed by advertising on the internet or it annoys me when I receive online ads based on my research history and I use ad bloggers when browsing the internet. So there is somehow a hostile environment for online activities and it's well much more balanced when we are in the offline world. And KPIs can help us and our customers to show the way. Because these customers can help us to compare offline and online campaigns. A lot of customers use only a companies use only a CPI cost per interest or cost per lead, as it's also called, and cost per order to compare the online and the offline media. 
but this is not enough. In this area, very often the online offers are much more convincing when I just take a look at CPI and CPO. But this is only the front end response. We should take a look what's, what will happen after we have acquired a lead or we have uh, gained an order. Because these figures only focus on the front end response. We should also focus on back end response and we can help our customers as postal operators to focus on the back end response as well. Concerning the back end response, we should use KPIs like the return rate of purchase goods, which is not included here, the churn rate of the customers, and very often it's higher when we acquire customers via online channels. We should focus on customer lifetime value based on different channels, online and offline and also the referral rate. And then we focus on back-end response as well. And by doing so, by using these KPIs on top to CPI and CPO, we can get a holistic view of, of, of the communication success. And this is needed. And this is something where we can support our customers to have this uh, holistic view as well. What is the conclusion from my point of view? Here, I would like to show uh, you the interesting results of um, some studies where we can learn something about the combination of online and offline. It, this study is based on the data from a European insurance company, and it uh, um, has a focus on the analysis of the effect of direct marketing on the conversion funnel. It was easy to find out that direct mailing has a significant influence or impact on consumer activity in the online channel as well. So direct mailing activities had a positive impact on the online activities as well. and. Very interesting that direct mailing was effective throughout the whole conversion funnel. So not just at the beginning, on the middle, but on the whole conversion funnel, there was a positive effect of direct marketing. And very interesting as well, they done, identified a joint effect of direct mailing and display advertising. So it's about the combination between, between the best of both worlds so we can see that synergies between direct mailing and display advertising. And um, it really proves that there is, the, the key result is that there is a wonderful opportunity to combine the online and the offline world. And it might be helpful for you as postal operators to conduct similar studies to convince your customers maybe in a partnership with other postal operators to convince them that it's about a combination of the online and offline world. There are some additional developments uh, on your side. We are all discussing the post cookie area, which will limit the online targeting options. We still have several in the offline world. The dependence on Google, Facebook, and co will increase. And the question you should, you can, you need to discuss with your customers is whether they want to be even more dependent on Google, Facebook, and co in the future with their walled gardens. And also one interesting aspect is the question of brand safety. Brand safety means that we need to protect the brands from showing their ads in a questionable or inappropriate content. And of course, it's much easier to assure brand safety in the, online, in the offline world than in the online world. So the key challenge is 
it's not an either or decision we still have these key steps of the within the conversion funnel but the customer is is uh, active in the online and offline world switching from one area to the other from one channel to the other from one instrument to the other and what we need to achieve is that we train our customers that they should behave no line because the customers really don't think am i online am i offline when i use my smartphone or my tablet uh, being in a brick and mortar store am i online or offline customers don't care so much about online or offline they just use what is helpful in a certain situation so we need to train our customers to think more no line and the key question is don't we ourselves we as postal operators only have the consulting competence to advise our customers optimally the holistic design of the customer journey so this is what is required what we try to achieve what we should try to achieve that we use our knowledge to combine the best of both worlds and if you need help convincing your customers feel free to contact me and now i would like to hand over once again to marty and here i am thanks ralf that was a tour de force through offline and online and i really liked some of the ideas you presented the first questions are already coming along um but um let's start a little bit from the beginning you started with telling us that there are some advantages um for the online advertising uh, market like short setup times or easy to track and so on uh, but you didn't tell us about the advantages of offline marketing so um so i like the idea to say okay we have to find out how we can learn from the online experience and how we can give this over to the offline experience but i'm quite sure that there might be some advantages for offline marketing as well so what do you think these are yes of course i i uh, thought that it's not necessary to carry coals to newcastle because you are the experts in uh, the advantages of the offline media but first of all one one main aspect from my point of view is that you have something or you can deliver something which will be in the hands of the customers so you are really using or you are addressing much more senses as i mentioned it uh, a little bit earlier that you really stop your customers just clicking away a certain message because they have your message in the hands and when you have an envelope where is already key benefit mention we you simulate creativity we have certain material i have to confess i just got a christmas present from lang und söhne where i bought a, a, a watch from a little bit earlier uh, christstollen and i saw the parcel and i again started to love the brand uh, so it's a uh, experience in the offline world which rarely happens and it was done in handwriting so i really have i'm not kidding i have it here in front of me it's a christmas card and you see here handwriting uh lieber herr kreuz ein frohes friedliches weihnachtswiss you best for christmas and i'm going to write a thank you to this company even so i know that they send out maybe 10000 20000 but i'm always surprised and i was happy to get it and i bought my watch uh, i think seven or se uh, seven or six years ago and uh, we are still in a relationship and this is something we can achieve and i know from my time at the german post a lot of wonderful uh, mailing opportunities uh, where we can use certain databases to tailor um, our target group and so on so these are from my point of view the key benefits and we need to convince our customers and maybe based on studies as well that there are a lot of huge uh, advantages and that they should not always focus on costs only mm -hmm. now we know that um, some of the 
executives are not really fond of long-term incentives, but more are looking more for short-term successes. Mm -hmm. So if the, the medium, the average uh, duration of a CMO or CEO is 18 months or 24 months or even, let's say, 30 months, he or she is probably looking to some successes when, when he is still on and not mm -hmm. after he is already with the next company. So what, what do you think are the main points, the, the main arguments I can do for, a, for an executive to convince him or her that uh, I should look into the long-term performance of campaign and that this makes sense? Um, how can I convince them? So I'm with you that uh, we have the short-term perspective in many areas. Uh, it would be nice to go to the CEO here who has a longer contract very often than the CMO. Uh, but this is not always uh, the best solution. Um, it would be very interesting to focus on the KPIs I mentioned earlier, customer lifetime value. So I'm really a fan of this as it's called value-based uh, customer management value-based and that we should take a look at the front end uh, KPIs as well because this is very interesting for the CMO as well whether he can generate additional value based on the existing customers on the newly acquired customers this would be very helpful as well and of course uh, at least the majority of the CMO still have the responsibility for brand building as well and so it's not either or, it's a combination. And when they, and there were very interesting discussions um, of Procter & Gamble, for example, saying we focus too long just on performance uh, marketing and we have to refocus on brand building as well. And this uh, discussion really inspired me to add this point to my presentation as well, that we often harness online what was uh, uh, saw on uh, offline beforehand and there again we have to saw and we have to to harvest at the same time but different things so it's about uh, the combination once again between the two between the two worlds so this is going in both directions um you you told us okay there is sometimes something sawn online uh, offline which is used online Mm -hmm. But I think it might be the other way around as well. So I see an online, online advertising and then I see the shop somewhere and I go into the shop and buy something. So it might, might go in both directions. It can go in both directions when we really conduct what we now call the omni-channel approach. And I regard it as so, let's say, ridiculous when I receive a message online by email a voucher and the company tells me, but you can only use this voucher online. Mm. And I said, I would like to go to the shop as well. And maybe I buy even more if I see the wonderful products around it. So what we really need when we want to achieve what is, from my point of view, one of the key criteria criterion uh, for success, uh, this is convenience. Let the customer decide where to use the voucher and don't tell him, Martin, you are only allowed to use this voucher in this channel. No, in this one not. So we need to be as convenient as possible. And convenience is something which is very often connected with the online world and less with the on offline world. And this is a piece. So it's, it's, so it's no line again. again it's no ways. line. Yes, a combination. Yeah. yeah. There's a question how to boost personalization in the post cookies era with the, with the depreciation of, of post cookies. So how can we optimize our first party data to compete with online channels? It's coming from Isham. Oh, I, I have always problem to pronounce these names. Uh, probably it's the same for you for my name. Saif Dine. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I would recommend uh, every company that they try to find out what kind of first uh, party data they already have acquired. Based on my experience, a lot of companies have a lot of data in their company, but it's not connected. Maybe it's not in line with the wonderful data protection rules, or people are just not aware of the data which is already available. We still have a lot of information silos in the companies, so my first step would be to 
find out what kind of information is already available in the company itself. And maybe, and this was something we did as a German post as well, we helped our customers to find the golden nuggets in their own data. To connect the data, sometimes there were different databases and we were able to match it, to have a holistic view, a uh, so single view of, uh, single point of truth, as it's often called. So this is something we need to achieve. And hopefully we can help our customers to uh, com connect the data and to, to help them to identify the gold nuggets. And then we can also try to find out what kind of uh, third or second party data might be helpful as well. And very often here, I connected once again with uh, my history at the German Post. We developed a micro geographic segmentation system where we can really help our customers to target their communication much more successfully as in the past. And so, again, we need to become a kind of data consultant as well for our customers to help them to be more successful also in the area of individualization. So I think this is a very interesting thought because what you're telling us that a postal operator is not only the one who well, transports my mailings from A to B, but he should be, at least should be, as well, my data consultant, my data scientist, delivering data, delivering know-how, delivering analytics, perhaps. Um, so helping me as a customer, as a big bank or insurance company or whatsoever mm -hmm. to do my marketing better. Do you think that postal operators have this abilities, question one, and even if they have the abilities that they, question two, that they are, well, that they have the renome, the trust to do that, because, well, some of the clients must just think they will only tell me to make more direct mailings because they are interested in direct mailings, nothing else. So is there, do they have the abilities and do they have the trust? I start with the trust first. So trust is what you earn when you have done a good job in the past. If nobody in this uh, team ever cheated the customers, um, so trust is a key point. If uh, the customers of ours have the impression that our results will always be biased and say, okay, sorry, but again, uh, the mailing is the best solution ever, then they will never, never, never trust us. So trust is key and I really regard trust as a new currency. And uh, when I was working for the German Post, I get some, uh, let's say, nice offers as well to do this or that with data. And I said, okay, I'm part of the German Post. I will never uh, want to cover with my story the headline of a famous new, uh, newspaper in Germany. So whenever, I've, whenever I would do something wrong, it will be in the media. So I was always sure, and I, I was in the data business for more than 30 years, and I have never a single conflict concerning the data usage. So trust is, from my point of view, the key resource to be successful in this business. So this is the basis. When we haven't invested in the creation of trust in the past, I don't want to say we need to shut our doors, but then we will not be successful in the data business. Concerning the ability, um, I want to, to say a sentence, who owns the data, owns the industry, owns the business. Who owns the data, owns the industry, owns the business. So data knowledge and data management is from my point of view, and not only from my point of view, a key driver of success. We can later on connect it with artificial intelligence and so on. So some postal organizations, some postal operators might already have this ab ability and they should use it for the well development of their customers and the others should check whether they could uh, develop themselves in the direction of, let's say, a data manager, a data scientist. Because if they don't do it, and now we can come back to the digital gap analysis I showed you earlier, since somebody else will come in and they will always start, the competitors will always start with the so-called low-hanging fruits. They can uh, uh, attack us in a little area and a bigger one and so on. And then in the end, we will be reduced in just uh, delivering things. 
Mm -hmm. The question is, do we just want to be, um, I say it in quotation marks, a stupid uh, delivery service? Or is our mission to be an enabler for being more successful in communication, in business? And I want to motivate uh, the postal operators to become enablers for companies, for their customers, to me be more successful in the challenging online world. And this would be, from my point of view, a wonderful vision for postal operators, enabler for digital business as a postal organization. Because in the end, there is, uh, when we think of e-commerce, there's often a parcel. And this has to be delivered. So why not start earlier in the value chain? So it wouldn't be the enabler for digital business, but the enabler for omnichannel business in some way to, to give the yes, ability I, to use all the channels. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I really focus on online business to make it more challenging. And uh, of course, you're right. It's all about no line. Once again, it's about the, the omnichannel approach. And we need to uh, start earlier in the food chain or in the value chain that we try to develop convincing solutions for our customers and to focus not only on one part, logistics within the value chain, but start a bit late earlier. And I have to tell you that the possibility to create value and good profit is often much easier when you are in the data business. I think that is a very interesting thought you just made because that would have been my, my additional question to that. Um, is there the data consultancy, data analytics, data part of the business? Is it a cost center for a postal operator to have more money on the on the on the delivery side to make more money there to have the profits there, or is it a profit center where I can do make money on both sides? I can make money on the data analytics side and as well on the delivery side. What do you think? I would, uh, in the beginning, of course, uh, you have to invest some money and you uh, will not be profitable uh, when you start this new business. But if you want to have the best possible services, you need to be as competitive as possible. And then you can ask for the services as well. We never, when I think about my six years at the German Post, uh, we all sold our services. These were data services and companies were willing to pay on top. But if we are able as a postal operator to connect the data world and the logistic world in a, a convincing way, then we have a competitive advantage other companies don't have. When they only focus on data and don't have the direct link to logistics, then they have a dis disadvantage. And try to make money out of it because then you can afford to have the best people in this area as well. And the cost center, thoughts. I don't want to say that people in the cost center are less, uh, let's say, uh, motivated and so on. But uh, if you really have to fight for the profit of your, of, your, uh, of your division, then you sometimes work harder because you really try to convince customers and I want to say once again, uh, referring to the term of trust in a reliable and trustful way. This mm -hmm. is, and when an online a campaign is better than an offline, then we need to tell our customers as well. Be a fair partner. This is my credo in this area. I think that's a very good, very good point. There are a lot of questions. Um, I'm, I'm trying to combine them always a little bit in the discussion. There was a question from Olivier with all those great insights, facts and figures you gave us. How do you explain that digital marketing spending is growing so fast? So shouldn't it be the other way around? If, if offline is, is so great, why is, is offline not growing so fast? Um, I would say, yes, I'm very honest. Traditional dialogue marketing is not sexy anymore. All people talk about online. When you talk about online, uh, everybody will listen to you. When you talk offline, they say, hmm, old, old school. So, so we need to... Yes, um, 
uh, we need to refocus by having convincing uh, arguments, convincing reasons why offline media is a very interesting one. So we need to, to change the direction. And uh, I really have to tell you, I had a book about dialogue marketing and uh, it sold very good at the beginning, but then dialogue market was out. So my latest book is uh, Customer Dialogue Online and Offline. So you always need to combine it. And, and this is also coming uh, to the point of trust building once again. If we as postal operators only say uh, offline, 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 offline is the key. Nobody will believe us. If you say offline and online or sometimes only online and sometimes only offline, we can create trust in our recommendation. So if we are always biased in our statements, then nobody will trust us. When we say, okay, it's about the best combination, the synergies between the two uh, channels, then we will uh, create additional um, credibility. And this is what we need to achieve. But we need a bit to reframe dialogue marketing. This is necessary. I totally agree. I, I, but it's, it's interesting that we have to, new, to use new words to make an old topic more sexy, but I think that's marketing as well in some way. Yeah. Um, one, one other question I got when I, I heard you talking about the genetics, um, well, you didn't talk about genetics, but what I was thinking is when you told us that even with the younger people, they are not really uh, that good in reading online and they don't get the whole full, full, full idea behind it. They cannot remember it that good. I thought, okay, so the genetics is the same as, our, as the two of us as we are older. Um, so genetics is not changing fast enough to give us humans the ability to, well, read online as good as we are reading offline, which would be a target. And then... I thought, okay, but maybe maybe it's just the experience which is different, or maybe the, the, the current experience is not good enough. So, for example, you told us if you have something in your hands, then you can, re can remember it better. So I can write on a touch screen with an with a, with a Apple, Apple stick or something like that, an Apple pen, as good as I can do on paper maybe. Or even a step far ahead, we are looking for Facebook, which is now renamed to Meta, mm -hmm. naming the Metaverse. And I'm thinking of um, augmented reality, virtual reality. So is it something where you think that in the, in the future we will have online media, which is as good as the traditional old offline media mm -hmm. in giving us the possibilities to understand things, to, to, to have them haptical, to, to tangible, to, well, you know what I mean? I think, yes, yes. well, we are, we are just 40 years in online now. We have thousands of years for offline. Mm -hmm. So maybe online is just not good enough already so that we will get some future online media, which is better than our current online media. Uh, I expect that the online world will offer us much more fun. But learning is not always fun. Sometimes learning is hard work and people can't concentrate any longer. There is a very interesting study from Microsoft saying the goldfish has a longer attention span than the average internet user. And when I hear from my, cust from my customers, which are students in many areas, that they don't read anymore. And we have... Uh, um, Students at the university saying, I never read a, a whole book in my life. Never. So it's about uh, getting some information on the fly while you are in the bus and so on, uh, listening to podcasts, whatever, nice things. But uh, to learn is some, uh, sometimes hard work as well. And when we only have fun in the metaverse later on, where we don't need to write anything any longer, we have Alexa and Google Home, we don't need to write. Or we have WhatsApp, where we hardly find a complete sentence. I'm exaggerating a little bit. Um, so we are not forced to write any longer. So we will only talk. Voice marketing is the next big thing. And then how can you really um, dig deep into complex methods to understand complexity? 
because when the surface is very easy to understand, very convenient, the complexity behind it is uh, is huge. And we need mm. people to be able to, ma to master complexity. But to be able to master complexity, you have to have a deep understanding of things. And there you have to invest time to go through it once uh, again and again. And it's not the tic-tac mode to learn something like this. Ralph, it's a fantastic discussion we just have. It's already five o'clock, but there are still coming questions. So I think we, we take, take another two questions which are already there. Um, Olivier, by the way, and Abby, if you want to come online, you can. Your camera and your microphone, are a, you are able to, to come online as well. So uh, one question I really find interesting is um, how do you deal with strong competition in the market when there are competitors who might have even more channels than a post uh, sector? So mm -hmm. how, how you can tackle them? So the, the classical media agencies, for example, or something like that. My solution to this is uh, partnering. You can't always do it on your own. And uh, my recommendation is that we are in the age of uh, cooperation. Competition is sometimes uh, the word for it, co cooperation and competition in one. Uh, we need, I really mean what I say, we really need to talk to our strongest competitors as well. And maybe our main competitors are Facebook and Google and not the advertising agency around the corner. So it's about partnering. Um, and my, my example for this is that even brands like BMW and Daimler started a corporation to work together because they said we can't compete with Tesla alone. We are too small. So let's uh, start a corporation. And they were friends like this for many years for decades, friends like this. Now they say, okay, let's try to do something together because we don't have the money and we don't have the time. So partnering mm -hmm. is uh, networking is one of the key results. And uh, as a postal operator, I think in, in all the countries you have trust. So this is a good starting point. And then try to uh, leave your, let's say, information or service silo and start to work on solutions which are good for your customers. Not only for you, but good for your customers. Try to uh, connect uh, points which normally the customers have to connect. So help them being a consultant and bringing them to new channels. Mm -hmm. This would even answer the last questions we just got to about the question, how do, you, how do you get the old customers who are more offline as a postal mm -hmm. operator to get more online. And I think it's mm -hmm. the same answer in the end. Mm -hmm. You have to, to show the way, you have to have the, the consultant for them mm -hmm. and then help them to these new channels. Ralph, that was really, really fantastic. And I think with all the questions, we saw that everybody was very, very attentive. We are still more than 50 people online. So um, I think this is another good sign that everybody was really interested. I'm getting already a lot of thank yous Uh, so, uh, thanks from my point of view. I think I will give over to Olivier maybe for a second. He looks like he wants to say something. So, uh, I will give him that, <laughs> that chance. <laughs> I, I, I want to say so many things. First, thank you, uh, Ralph. It's, it's, to be honest, one of the best cases I've heard in, in, in a long time uh, regarding the, this uh, omni-channel approach and, and this offline-online uh, magic formula. So really, thank you. You've given us so many things to think about. And I'm thinking about my colleagues around the world that are dealing with those topics on a daily, on a daily, uh, on a daily business. Uh, I think they have taken up a lot, a lot, a lot of things for, for, for them uh, to, uh, to improve and to, uh, to develop their, their, their business. So thank you so much, Ralph. There are so many key words that I could just throw now from from what you gave us uh, around data around trust around partnership around consultancy, consultancy competence i think that's a key word also that we really need to think about and uh, how we are making sure that our customers uh, understand the value and 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 the convenience and 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 uh, the the yeah the the value of, of of what we can offer in this offline and online world as postal network so really thank you i i think listening to you and, and and knowing a little bit the the, the business we're operating in 
I think postal operators are really sitting on the gold mine. The, the idea now is with everything you've given us today is that we can transform that, that gold mine into a pot of gold. And, and I really hope that everybody will take on all those insights and, 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 and use them uh, in, in their uh, business life. So really thank you, uh, Ralph, uh, for this uh, fantastic uh, presentation and all the answers you, you have provided to, uh, to, the, to the audience today. And, and I'm sure it's not the, the last time we will hear about you in the postal world. So thank you so much. And I wish everybody uh, a very uh, happy and, and, uh, and a great end of the year. Please stay healthy. It's uh, we're still in a difficult situation wherever we are, uh, whether here in Europe or Africa or in Asia or Latin America. I mean, guys, be safe and uh, really happy new year in advance. And uh, we will probably talk again in the new year to come. So thank you again, Ralph. Thanks, Martin. Thank you very much, Abby, for all the support in, in bringing this uh, this series uh, to life. And uh, I wish you all a very good uh, end of the day, end of the morning, end of the afternoon. Thank that you. was Bye -bye. great final work, Olivier. Thanks, Ralph, once again. Thanks to you. Uh, I'm looking forward to innovation talk number 9, 10, and 11, or whatsoever. So if you have fun with us, uh, send Abby or Olivier some email and say, well, we should go on. Uh, they might be able to do so. And um, yeah, happy holidays, I would say. And mm -hmm. Ah, by the way, Ralph's presentation is all, also, as he is a scientific guy, including some, some sources. So if you're interested in that one, I'm sure Abby will be helped to, to send that one to you. Yes. And you find his contact details in there as well. So if you're interested to get in touch with Ralph, you should be able to do so. There are a lot of things I think that is for this year. Thanks a lot to all of you and happy holidays. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.